There's a light in the sky, rising in the air. There's a feeling so strong. It's time to light the fire, like a bright shining light. Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy, and yes, that was me in a bath, Joe. Yes. You've got to stop laughing every week I can't that comes help on. It's Darcy in a bath. Why, why, Darcy why, in a why bath. does it make you laugh every single time? Welcome to all of you. Hi, Zee, buddy. It's good to be good with you, you as always. <laughs> Can I talk about one of my great passions? I can't get enough coffee. I love it. Ooh, yeah. Maybe you overdo it a, a bit, Joe, but we're going to just get into coffee today. What's your favourite brew? Uh, I will have a latte, a soy latte for me, but it seems that is the most popular type of coffee in Victoria, South Australia and Tassie, the latte. Queensland and WA, the Northern Territory and ACT prefer flat whites. I thought they were the same. Lattes and flat whites. Anyway, uh, cappuccino <laughs> is king in New South Wales. I think there is an art to it. What's fascinating is that someone's actually sat down and done those statistics mm. around the country and all the alternative milk solutions coming up nowadays. So we've got plant-based milks, almond, what, macadamia, yeah. cashew, oat milk, rice mm. milk. Personally, for me, you're going to laugh at my coffee order. So, brace yourself. Here we go. <laughs> this is what I order. A large, weak almond latte but made with... Half hot water, half milk, please. How Isn't high are you? What? <laughs> <laughs> and then I take that home and blend it with collagen powder, maca and medicinal mushrooms. Oh, all right. <laughs> I've got to say, we are okay. not alone with our coffee obsession. More than two billion people consume coffee regularly. The world's top consumers are actually Finland, Norway and the Netherlands, which was actually a surprise mm. to me. Now, I love the musical 42nd Street, but we're actually number 42 on the list, which surprises me because I feel like when you walk out in the streets of of Australia, everyone is sipping a coffee. So, whether you take it white with one, a long black, short iced or a little twist of lemon, coffee is definitely a national obsession. But getting that perfect cup isn't as simple as a good coffee machine and a skilled barista with a beard. This week, mm -hmm. I met up with a local roaster and supplier that's been in the biz for more than 25 years to get the scoop, the double shot on Australia's favourite brew. Coffee. Three quarters of Australians have at least one cup a day. But have you really thought about what it takes to make that cup of liquid gold? When you join a coffee industry, you start to learn the whole chain of coffee supply. Um, so the amount of effort that goes into sourcing coffee, working with farmers, finding coffee at origin, making sure it's the right quality, um, roasting it correctly, and then handing it over to a brister and the right training to make that coffee taste fantastic. There's a lot that goes into it, a lot more than people probably uh, think about. That sounds exhausting. I definitely need a coffee. So we've got uh, a bit of a selection here of our single origins. So. Um, you can pick whichever one speaks to you the most. All right, Costa Rica. Costa that looks Rica. pretty good. Good, good choice. Here at Veneziano, Jack is an expert in all things coffee, and he's going to take me through just a fraction of the process. It's been milled, and now it's our job to turn it brown. How do you source the beans? It's about what are you trying to achieve in the cup? Do you want something that's bright and fruity, or dark and chocolatey, or and rich? About a kilo a. It's about two kilos of scoop. OK. We'll see how close and you how get. how much do we need? Eight. Eight. The world's a lot smaller place now. You know, I've sourced beans through Facebook messaging a grower who I'm interested in. You know, I've tasted your coffee somewhere and I'd love to, love to try a little bit more and get to know you. And next thing you know, you're on a plane and you're, you're at their farm and you're staying with the family and you're tasting coffee and you start a, a beautiful relationship. All right, what next? So we use uh, a computer system here to monitor our bean temperature, our air temperature, uh, airflow, everything that's going on during a roast so that we can do the same thing every time. As we can see in here, is that also a good visual gauge as to 100%. how far they're coming along? Yeah, so we're looking uh, how is the colour progressing uh, and we're also able to look at the colour in our little sampler here. Oh, hello. OK. And how long does this take? Uh, on this roaster, around 12 to 13 minutes. Do different type of beans require different types of roasting? Yeah, absolutely. You look at an origin like 
Kenya, high altitude, so they're a lot denser. Yeah. So um, they require a lot more heat to caramelize all the sugars and develop the organic acids. Whereas a coffee from Brazil needs to be a little bit more gentle to make sure you don't burn the coffee. That smells so good. Is that the colour you're looking That's for? That's the colour we're looking for. And when we're at a coffee shop and we taste a coffee and it tastes burnt, is it because it was burnt in this process or burnt in the machine? I mean, we're roasting to 205 degrees here and a coffee machine only goes to 95 to 96 degrees. So it's not going to burn at the machine, but it can be the way the barista makes it as well, okay. or it can be the roast. OK, it's one thing to roast it, but for me, it's all about the taste. Cupping's how we assign a qualitative measure to a coffee. So it's nose in the bowl. Okay. So cupping the coffee involves smelling it and smelling it and then smelling it some more oh. until it's time to taste it. And this is where the art of slurping comes in. However, none of this goes down the hatch. I really need that coffee. What do you think is next for the coffee scene here? The industry in general is going to have a lot of pressure put onto it. Less land, climate change is a thing, it's happening. So I think at the end of the day, don't be afraid of paying a little bit more for coffee here. Um, and a lot of that will transfer backwards as well. That's really good. That's good. I feel like the roast had a, had a, had a bit of a part in it. Oh, is this my beans? Oh, uh, maybe. No wonder it's so good. <laughs> Can I just say that actually was, despite being my beans, was a very, very good coffee. And I really love what they're doing there at Veneziano Coffee in Richmond. I will be back and back again and again. They'll be kicking me out. <laughs> Why do you have to do that? <laughs> What's going on there? Well, apparently it helps get the coffee right into the back of our palate and we're oh. aspirating. So we're getting air in there so that we can totally do, like, get the full taste and texture of it uh -huh. and then you spit and you spit all out. Like Which wine tasting shame. with the coffee. I know. Yeah, right. right. You know, you want to drink it. But you know what? I am confused because one year coffee is evil mm -hmm. and then the next year we're told that it's good for us. Look. Which is right. Coffee's high in antioxidants, which fights free radicals, but I think the issue with coffee is if we're having beyond that one or two cups a day, mm. we're starting to get things like adrenal fatigue sit in. And the other thing is, if you find that you have a negative reaction to coffee, it's probably not good for Best you. Just steer clear. Yeah, just steer clear. But it's also what people are adding to it. Coffee in its whole form, beautiful, drunk in a long black, Great. It's the sugars, the milks, all the other flavourings they're adding that takes it out of the health realm. Mm. Thanks, Heinze. A whole lot more to uncover when it comes to coffee. We're going to filter out the myths and serve up the facts on our favourite brew. Looking forward to this right after the break on The House of Wellness. You're watching the House of Wellness where today, Joe, we're waking up to the smell of coffee mm. by looking at the pros and cons of Australia's favourite hot brew. Joining us on the couch, bona fide coffee lover, I believe, <laughs> and our tech expert, <laughs> Vanessa. A bit of a passionate coffee drinker, I believe. Look, I think they kick you out of technology if you're not a passionate coffee drinker. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Now, you've got some great uh, coffee-related apps to show us at the moment. Before we get into that, there are a fair few myths surrounding coffee. And, Joe, as you said earlier, the health information surrounding it seems to change every week. So we've yes. done a bit of research to just get to the bottom of it all. Let's start with, I suppose, myth. Does coffee cause insomnia? You've done some homework. Uh, well, I Googled it. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes and no, because coffee does obviously contain caffeine, which does alter your brain function, which is a stimulant. So that can keep you awake. But the great thing is that if you have a normal sensitivity to caffeine then your liver flushes it out really quickly, so mm. between four and seven hours apparently. So if you have a drink at three o'clock, you should be right by bed. If you're highly sensitive to caffeine, then maybe it's a bit different for you. In a few hours. And the other mm. myth is that coffee causes dehydration and caffeine is a natural diuretic. So if you are having coffee, you are going to be going to the toilet a lot more frequently. But the key is to make sure you're super hydrated during the day in mm. conjunction with um, having your coffee. 
One of the other myths is that uh, coffee, after a few drinks of wine or a beer over dinner, you can have a coffee just to reverse effects of alcohol, Joe. Okay, not, not true. true. <laughs> 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 no, worth a try, but not no. true. <laughs> Look, I've heard that you can get really bad headaches if you stop drinking coffee, but uh, I'm really fortunate. I don't seem to get headaches in any case at all. Oh, oh mm. lucky you. Mm. But you wouldn't give up the coffee just to test that? No, I think it's too risky, really. <laughs> why why, why risk you? it? Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing with coffee is that the caffeine actually constricts our blood vessels which gives us the effect that we're maybe getting rid of that headache, but then as soon as the caffeine's out of our system, mm. our blood vessels reopen and there's an increase of blood flow, which then returns the headache. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, actually. Mm. Fair to say we all love our coffee uh, here. Vanessa, tell us about some of the great apps to find the perfect brew. Look, um, there are apps to do all sorts of things, like to find, to make and to track your caffeine consumption. So they're all really helpful. I think Broadsheet is probably the best in Australia in terms of finding a great brew. They care so much about about uh, the food and wine industry. They'll also post a lot about cultural things so you can go and see something entertaining along with your coffee. Yeah, I love Broadsheet. And they have one for every capital city they in do. Australia. Yeah, and it's just that. a really awesome way of knowing where to eat out, what you want to see mm. for entertainment and where to get the best coffee. While you're travelling. Yeah. Now, we don't always want to spend money on coffee, so a great way to get better at making your own coffee is to use an app like Coffee Cup Guru, which will talk you through the best process to get the most out of your French press or any other technique that you're using in the home. Mm. Does it take into account, like, screaming children in I the know. background? <laughs> I was going to say. The house isn't always a happy, calm place. Yeah, isn't follow. the best coffee made for you by someone else? Look, maybe <laughs> you might go with the quieter method rather than a noisy, you know, machine coffee. You might go with your French press in that case, a drip coffee. Oh, yeah, right. That's like that American one that you see on all the sitcoms there. Yes. <laughs> so, so it's really important, as you were saying, to keep yeah. track of how much caffeine is in your body. You can use the Caffeine Tracker mm -hmm. app and uh, that will let you keep track of what you're drinking and the caffeine you're getting from incidental things, not just from coffee. Oh, like uh, espresso martinis. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A lot of caffeine yeah. in them. All the very, tiramisu. All <laughs> yeah. very useful information. <laughs> no, thanks, uh, Rach, and thanks, uh, Joe, for that. A big trend in coffee, though, is the Bullet Coffee Heinzy. What can you tell us about that? Mate, that is exactly right. That is when we combine the health benefits of MCT keto tonic with grass-fed butter or ghee and long black coffee. Now, I'm going to show you how easy it is to put one together. I'm going to make us all one so that we can enjoy how good it is. Now, MCT is called medium-chain triglycerides, which is a fantastic source of fat that our body readily uses as a form of energy. We love it for hormonal balance, brain function, energy and mood. So we're going to add kind of per person, we're looking at about a teaspoon or a tablespoon. But I've got to warn you, if you go too hard too early on the MCT, <laughs> you can uh, be running to the toilet very quickly, which oh. is good for your cardio, but not necessarily good for your, uh, your bowel. Not good when you're on telly. Exactly. <laughs> I hope you're going to enjoy the rest on. of today's show. <laughs> now, the other reason we're using grass-fed butter or ghee is because the cows that live on a natural diet produce something in this called butyrate. And butyrate, we're always talking about gut health, and butyrate helps support our gut health. So we're going to pour a little bit of MCT, we've got the grass-fed ghee, and then we've got a beautiful black coffee. Now, oh, hello, we're going to pour that in, just like so. About a cup or so is going to be absolutely perfect, and then you can do it in a powerful food processor or a blender, or you can use a stick blender like this, and we get wisdom, doesn't take much. <laughs> And less noisy. There we go. All right, as now. Heinze prepares that coffee, I can't <laughs> wait to try one. Uh, but up next, we look at what's good for the soul when we meet a designer who's stitching up sustainable and ethical clothing by putting the fair into fashion. <laughs> Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Heinzy's brewed up a uh, fresh bullet coffee. Never seen Joe Stanley more nervous in my entire life than right now. <laughs> I'm not so, nervous. You, you are nervous. She has just made us think that it's going to have a negative effect on my bowels. <laughs> which no. I'm worried about. Nappies yeah. up in the dressing room. It's all good. Mm. Is this a down the what hatch look? I like it. You like it? It's, it's creamy. It's smooth. And it, for anyone who goes, OK, I can't drink black coffee, but I don't want to ditch my milk yet, the ghee or the butter adds a really beautiful texture. And Joe, it's, it's very, Joe, very, what's that it's face? Very, it's very strong coffee flavour. Yeah, and yeah. 
Well, I like my coffee with a lot of soy milk, so it's quite nutty and oh. creamy. See, I'll so. have this, but I add some extra goodies like cinnamon, nutmeg, and maca powder. And there that we go. Gives it, That's gives show it business. A really powerful <laughs> punch. I like it. It's very well rounded, and, and the, the strength of the coffee is quite balanced somehow. Oh, mm. thank you. Mm. Thank you. I'll be here all week. Good job. <laughs> wow. Well, that'll clear out the cobwebs uh, for you, Rach. Mm. Uh, no doubt about that. <laughs> now, now, to fair trade of a different kind. <laughs> Everyone loves a bargain, especially when it comes to clothing. However, the cheap price tag can mean someone less fortunate is paying the ultimate price, Joe. Absolutely, Darce. Not all clothing brands do the right thing, particularly by their offshore employees. And I think as consumers, we're becoming much more conscious about where our clothes come from and what's involved with making them. And on the back of that positive trend, an Australian celebrity stylist and designer who's very dear to our hearts has started a jeans label with ethics and the environment so into every stitch. As a fashion stylist, Deb Schultz dresses some of our most recognisable stars. Different shows have to present a different image, like some need to look really pro um, professional and authoritative and others need to look fun and relaxed and you can convey that through the clothes so that when they're presenting on camera, they're not worried about how they look, they can just focus on what they need to say. <laughs> But six years ago, a tragic news story forced her to re-examine her place in the fashion industry. When the Rana Plaza, a nine-storey factory in Bangladesh, collapsed in 2013, 1,100 garment workers lost their lives. People knew that it was dangerous, but they were threatened that they would lose a month's wage if they didn't go back to work. So people went back to work and the building collapsed and it was it's the worst disaster that's ever been in retail manufacturing. I'd been working in fashion for years and I guess I was really asleep at the wheel, like just trusting companies that they were paying their workers correctly. And Rana Plaza just really woke me up to the fact that our garments are actually exploiting women and sometimes children on the other side of the world. With her eyes open to the injustices of a large sector of the clothing manufacturing industry, Deb began her own research that revealed some shocking truths. A lot of people don't actually realise that their distressed denim is literally blasted with sand and it's causing silicosis in the workers, a form of um, emphysema and lung cancer, and people are dying. And unfortunately, these men know that this is causing them harm, but they're only earning $70 a month and they have to keep working to feed their family. And it doesn't need to be this way. There's actually ways of distressing denim that doesn't involve that. You've got to pull the pockets out. Out. Inspired to take action, Deb started Justice Denim, a brand guaranteed to be free from exploitation. While most garment workers overseas can earn as little as 39 cents an hour, Deb chose to manufacture in Melbourne, where the employees are paid fairly and the processes are safe. We scrape the denim, you can use lasers, you can use hand grinding. It's all done by hand, piece by piece, just to protect the workers. Each pair of jeans is meticulously detailed by hand, making every garment unique. That looks amazing. Yeah, see, that's because that's, that's 100% cotton, yeah. so you're going to get what you want. Yeah, that's amazing. Deb even packages and posts every order from home, so customers know they're getting a truly local product. Workers' rights aren't the only thing strengthening the fabric of Justice Denim. Environmental impact is also a big focus. We are a zero waste model, so we collect all the scraps at the factory and we donate them to quilters who actually recycle them all into quilts. So yeah, that's pretty exciting. She also donates a portion of her profits. The charities that we work with actually send people in and rescue child slaves from brothels and all sorts of horrendous conditions and bring them to safe homes and we then pay for their education to help them with their future. I think a person should feel like their best self in our genes, but I also think they should feel really proud knowing they funded four weeks education for a child and continue to keep Australian manufacturing alive. Fashion can definitely be environmentally friendly and ethical, both equally important.
Well, it's a, very, a story very close to all of our hearts because the beautiful lady that you just saw in the story is not only producing great fashion and for a great cause, she's also our own Deb Schultz, who we work with every day here at Channel 7. Deb, you are a legend. Congratulations. Thank you, Luke. And a bit of justice denim uh, you're wearing and also to Joe. And I love it. When we talk to you, always talking about not only uh, what we're wearing but where it comes from, you have such a great passion for this. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think it's really important just to make sure that what we're wearing is protecting workers. I think it's very easy on this side of the world not to think about that and just see something we like and not even consider it. Um, but more and more ethics and environment is becoming a consideration in fashion. What do you think is next? What needs to be done still? I think um, people just need to ask more questions about, mm. about where their clothes are made and what people are being paid and what conditions they're working under. Because child slavery and people suffering and, like you said, dying for our clothes yeah. just makes us feel sick in the yeah, stomach. How absolutely. can we ensure that we're not buying into those clothes? It is very difficult. You just need to ask questions, I think. Just contacting brands, be have a voice on Instagram and just really use social media to dig a little deeper rather than just trusting companies. There's laws put in place when it comes to food packaging and how we can sell food. Is there the same type of movement when it comes to fashion for ethics and fair trade? We have um, Ethical Clothing Australia who certify clothing within Australia, but from offshore, no. Because I do think, and I've looked into this myself in the past, that often it's hard because certain brands are buying from other brands and like mm. it can be hidden in yeah. the background, can't it? It can be very hidden in the background. So. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we dig around? What kind of powers do we have available to us? I think just using your dollar as much as you can and asking the companies directly, really digging into their website and having a look at where things are manufactured and mm. doing your own research because there's a lot of greenwashing going on. Look, so. talking of voting with our dollar, price is a consideration for most of us. Yeah. Can we buy really funky fashion that's also, you know, cost effective but not doing the wrong thing? Mm. We can. It is a little more expensive buying garments that have been made well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely doable. Okay, good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can go to Justice Denim and have a look at Deb's stuff because it only looks great. Deb, uh, we really uh, love what you do. And I was amazed to hear that story that distressed denim actually is costing people potentially their lives with the effects that you told us in that story. Do we need to move away from that look or are there other options? Oh, there's definitely other options. We just need to look for brands that are distressing by hand, grinding, that sort of thing that's um, not causing emphysema. I I love to see that you are manufacturing locally because I think the assumption is that if you're purchasing fashion that's sort of more readily available that that doesn't happen here in Australia but obviously there's lots of brands that manufacture here yes there's there's a few it's yeah not, <laughs> it's not a huge industry unfortunately yeah does that yeah. cut into then your profits because I'm assuming yeah. people who fa manufacture overseas make a yeah. much larger it's at profit 39 margin. cents an hour versus 39 dollars an hour difference so it's quite dramatic <laughs> yeah. but yeah, Deb wow. you are literally changing lives you're yes. helping putting kids through school I mean that must in itself feel incredible it does. do you get any personal feedback from some of those people that you're actually helping yeah we do we get little testimonies and letters and yeah that's that's actually amazing as a mum to receive oh, those mm, so beautiful as a mother that you know that's so amazing to, to hear well just as a human to know that yeah. other people in the world are looked after because we're all together we're all one big community yeah. globally and can I say I love they are yeah. so yeah. comfy Smoking. So so amazing job Deb honestly yeah. we're so yeah. proud of you yeah, yeah definitely about it. putting people before profits thanks again uh, Deb for the great work uh, that you do we love working with you and uh, helping us all make much better choices, more informed choices. Up next, uh, they call it liquid gold in a bottle, plus we look at the natural way to protect your eyes from too much screen time. That's coming up on The House of Wellness. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. We're all about celebrating nature's powerhouses as a way to fight and prevent disease. Isn't that right, Heinz? Correct, us. We know the benefits of using olive oil in cooking and salads and that olives taste great and are packed with good fats and nutrients. But as I found out, the fruit isn't the only part of the olive tree that packs a punch in the goodness steaks. <laughs> I'm a long way from Greece. In fact, I'm headed to a small farming community at Esk, west of Brisbane, where they're harvesting some of the largest crops of olive leaf anywhere in the world. We've got about 850,000 trees here, and we've got two properties, and we specialise in olive leaf extracts. 
Aaron Pryor manages over 245 hectares of Kambita olive groves, but there's not an olive to be seen. Yeah, I love olives too, but um, unfortunately the trees, we cut them back consistently every 12 months. So to produce fruit, the, the timber sort of needs to get to two years of age. So unfortunately, no olives. <laughs> I can live without the olives because what's going on here is about harnessing the antioxidants and good fats that come from the leaf. It's really only in the last 20 years that we've been doing a lot of research into the full health benefits of a fresh picked olive leaf extract. And so within the last 15 years, the product has become very popular. What started 17 years ago with over 60 varieties of olive tree has been whittled down to just four. It has to do with climate and also the alluropin content which is the antioxidant that we're all after from the leaf. Extracting all that goodness from the freshly picked leaf works like a well-oiled machine. It's as sustainable as possible. Pesticides are a last resort. Their first line of defence? Fighting off bad bugs with good ones. And really cute ones at that. I guess we use ladybirds, the harmonia, and we use lacewing, a little, another little insect, and build an ecosystem within our farms. You know, the bad bugs get eaten by the good bugs and, and life goes on. So where do you get the good bugs from? So they come from a local supplier in Toowoomba and we just tell them how many we need and we usually release probably uh, 10,000. So they come a in a, a little, little box, tub, little yep. tub, and then yeah. how do you distribute them on the actual plant? The team come out here and we put them in little containers and we put them where the pressures are heavier. So we might put, you know, for example, in this area, there might be two or three tubs put really? in here and, and, and they just disperse out amongst the trees. You can genuinely tell that it's a nice, healthy plant because you can reach just about anywhere and see some nice new growth of the leaf. Every step of the process is kept as natural as possible, from the growth and harvesting right through to the processing. No sugars, no alcohol or preservatives. We can't show you exactly how the goodness is extracted from the olive leaf itself. That's because the magic happens in these large stainless steel vats. And well, also because it's top secret and I can't find out either. But the most astounding thing about this product is the speed at which the leaf goes from harvest to this liquid gold. It all happens in just under six hours. The time frame is important and so is the actual act of extraction. Traditionally in the Mediterranean, they would actually use these leaves as an infusion, as a tea, and that's going to retain the polyphenols. And we've, in the same way, in that hot water extraction method and getting it straight to the bottle in a supplement, in the same way we're getting that strong, rich antioxidants to the supplement form. I love the connection to the process still used in the Mediterranean. To access such freshness that's been processed from tree to bottle so fast is amazing. Up to 15,000 litres a week is shipped out for bottling and sale, both here and abroad. What I love is that we're utilising the entire tree. Mm. Extra virgin olive oil for exactly. our cooking and dressing, olives in our salad and then the olive leaf extract. So should I get into this? I think so. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what do you think? I tell you what, <laughs> if this is looking after myself each and every morning, I can do that 15 mil. That's fantastic. Wonderful. I feel alive. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Those ladybugs, <laughs> Daisy. Not only beautiful to look at, but what a job they do. Mate, I wanted to take a few home with me. That was so cute. But I wanted them to stay there doing their thing. Now, here at the House of Wellness, herbs and natural remedies are our heroes, right, Gerald? So much so that they can even battle the negative effects of too much screen time. And aren't we now in a generation where screen time is playing havoc with our eyes? So we're looking at televisions, iPads, computers, just non-stop. It doesn't really ever end, does it? So what's the biggest culprit when it comes to a negative effect? It's called blue light. So we're talking here about high energy, short wavelength light, Luke, that our eyes actually don't filter out all that well. So the light goes right to the back of our eye. That's to our retina. That's a very important part. And it, it means that it threatens the health of our retina, particularly as we age. Are there any natural ways to protect our eyes? Isn't it interesting? Nature has 
natural sunglasses, so blue light filters. And the nutrients are zeaxanthin and lutein, which occur together. So they're antioxidants, and they actually function by blocking, to a fair degree, that blue light action that's going to the back of your eye. All right, but now I know that these nutrients can be found in naturally in food, in dark green leafy vegetables such as kale and spinach, and egg yolks are excellent sources of lutein as well. Now, how do I say that Z word, the zeaxanthium? Zeaxanthium. Zeaxanthium is yes. also found in egg yolk and in capsicum, mandarins as well, is that right? Yes, brightly coloured things. And, of course, the big thing these days is carrots because we, they're packed with beta-carotene. So they are actually a natural antioxidant for the eye as well. And don't forget, with eye health, fish oil, because fish oil is a natural moisturiser for mucous surfaces and for eye tissue. But while you can find all of these nutrients in foods, they are available in supplement form, aren't they? And a once a day. How important is that? And how easy is that, Heinze? Who would benefit most from taking them? Well, look, those of us who wear glasses, those of us working on screens fairly heavily, those prone to age-related macular degeneration, which is a, a disease which is actually awful, and those who have cataracts. So that's a fair branch of people. And also, too, take a break from a screen. Get a break regularly and always check with your healthcare practitioner to make sure that the formulation you get is the right one. The A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy, New Zealand's number one premium supplement brand, now available in Australia. Thanks for joining us on the House of Awareness. Anyone who's had chronic back pain can tell you how debilitating uh, physically and mentally it can be, Jo. Yes. The agony can be made worse by thinking ongoing medication or full-on surgery is the only answer. Oh, yeah. We all know someone who's suffered from this kind of pain and to feel like you really don't know where to turn other than surgery, I think, can make it much worse. But that is last resort stuff. There's a range of hands-on health experts out there to help, but it's hard to know which one to go for. Last week in the first of our series of back to basics, we saw what a chiropractor does and this week we're checking out an osteopath. Osteopath Dr Michelle Funder runs her own practice in Melbourne. Her clientele come in all shapes and sizes. And how did you feel after the last treatment, do you remember? We treat a lot of footballers, local community, netballers, especially on a Monday morning after a heavy weekend of sport. We also get a lot of desk workers, postural strains, people come in for chronic headaches and migraines. But really it's a wide variety, so any musculoskeletal injury. So I'll get you to nice and slowly bend forwards towards your toes if you can. In treating any injury, getting to the source of the pain is paramount. And in Michelle's business, it's all about the holistic approach. So you're feeling it quite low down? Yeah. In through there, okay. Yep. Osteopaths will assess not only the area of the symptom that's giving you the injury, but the whole body. So for example, if you are coming in with low back pain, we're not just looking at your lower back, but the spine above the lower back, your hips, your pelvis, your knees, your feet, your ankles. We're trying to really problem solve as to what the root of the cause is for that low back, because yeah, the symptoms are in the lower back, but perhaps it's that knee on the left that's a little bit weak, or you've had an old fracture in that that's actually driving that chronic low back pain. So bring the feet slightly closer together. Adam Sassy is a personal trainer. After a groin injury impacted on his lower back, he's been fronting up for treatment with Michelle for the last four weeks. So we're gonna just have a feel of how the hips move. I'm just... It's quite a debilitating injury. A bit tight. I had my condition a little over 12 months. At times it's been worse than other times over that period, but it's flared again whilst training for marathons. Perfect, and I'm just gonna check your leg lengths. Osteopaths have a lot of different tools in their belt uh, for treatment techniques. So generally there'll be some soft tissue work, dry needling, which is great for trigger point release. We often use spinal manipulation, which is a very gentle mobilization of the spinal joints. A technique called muscle energy technique, which is about stretching the joints and helping relax them. Try and keep that left leg nice and still. We're very much into exercise prescription, so helping rehabilitate injuries to make sure that we can reduce the injuries occurring in the future. 
So I'm just gonna have a bit of a feel through your back. So I had physiotherapy initially, and with their treatment was also a suggestion of rest, which helped to a point. I believe that seeing Michelle has helped me with really focusing on the back and those muscles in the back to loosen up particularly whilst continuing to train. It's feeling a lot better than last week through those tissues. I think that the top similarities between all of the professions is that our number one goal is about the patient and helping them on their journey to help with their injuries or whatever they're presenting with. I often say to clients, you know, as long as you've got a good connection, you trust the person that you're working with and you're starting to see some results or understand why you might not be seeing results, that's probably the most important thing. How's that feel through there? Feels fine, yes, feels good. I have to tell you, I love my osteo because I'm not an athlete. Might surprise you to know that. Um, Dust. But so all the anything that happens to me is just through wear and tear of life, like being on the computer for too long or waking up with your neck a bit weird or whatever. And I, yeah. I've been seeing him for like 12 years. How often would you see him? Oh, only when I feel like I need it. So not ongoingly. He'd probably like me to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, he goes and you get manipulations like full on deep tissue massage, the needling I love, mm. lots of different, and and the spinal kind of manipulation you get from. Cairo, but it's sort of more whole body. I've never had life. any of it, so I wonder do I do it only when I have an issue or should I be doing this as long term maintenance and getting it every w little while? Well, I go when I have an issue and he gives me exercises to do in between seeing him until it kind of clears up. Like, I don't feel the need to continue on. Um, I know that you get regular massages, so mm. perhaps it's similar to that, just maintaining your posture and your, you know, that looseness in your, mm. in your body. Definitely. Yeah. I just find it's a maintenance thing and I, I couple that with infrared saunas, cryotherapy, like all these beautiful <laughs> treatments just to keep everything in balance. I'm interested with your background, Dust, because I know obviously yep. with, with footy, you said you started with physio but you made the switch. Footy was the exclusive domain of the physio and you really didn't cross over. In fact, if someone went and saw a car, you wouldn't tell the physio because a very competitive, <laughs> oh, uh, competitive uh, group. But after footy, uh, my wife suggested, suggested we go and see the car. It was, mm. And I love the car. I think it's about finding someone yeah. who gets you, understands you. I heard, love what the osteo said in that package about preventative exercise and strength exercise and I'm a big believer in preventative rather than waiting. A bit like what you're saying, Rach. Mm. Is feeling good. How do you keep it going that way before you How are you now? What type of condition would well, you describe yourself Well, outstanding now? actually. <laughs> yeah, I Thanks for asking. No, I, 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 did my, I did my knee twice. Yeah. Uh, uh, full reconstruction of my knee. So I don't run a lot. I'd, li I'd like to be able to do more of that but that was probably the thing that got me uh, you know, wanting to make sure I didn't, you know, blow out. A lot of ex-players, you go in two categories, you stay healthy mm. or blow out. So trying and to stay... And which are you? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty sorry. funny for you. <laughs> that was part two of our three-part series, Back to Basics. Next week, we're going to look at the uh, physios and the great work that they do. And then we're going to get three of our hands-on specialists to join us in studio, which I'm really looking forward to. Joe, mm -hmm. up next, my first ever visit to the Red Cross Blood Service. Everyone's mad for whole roasted cauliflower right now, so I'm giving it a spin. Serving it with a spiced almond butter and flavouring it with turmeric, a powerful antioxidant. Begin by mixing olive oil, cumin and garlic together in a bowl. Turmeric adds flavour, but Biogland High Zorb Turmeric Powder is a blend of healthy fats and black pepper that helps improve absorption of curcumin for vitality and well-being. Once the collie is coated in the spices, transfer it into a lidded pot and bake for an hour, removing the lid after 45 minutes. And while it's baking, make a dressing by combining almond butter with orange juice, tamari or soy sauce, and a pinch of chili. Remove from the oven, drizzle with the dressing and garnish with coriander. You can believe the hype. Whole roasted cauliflower with spiced almond butter is every bit as good as it looks.
Welcome back, uh, Joe. Did you know that Winston Churchill <laughs> once said, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give? I love that. Oh. He was a very wise person. No, I thought you'd Winston enjoy that. Now, those words take on special relevance <laughs> when it comes to giving blood, Rach. Mm, yes, they certainly do. And especially when one in three Aussies require blood in their lifetime, yet only one in 30 donate. So wow. every donation has the power to save up to three lives. And a, a new donor is needed every five minutes. It's incredible. Wow. Yeah, world blood donor donor days heading our way so I decided to heed the call to do my bit to help first time that I've done it and the Red Cross blood service needs 99,000 new donors in the next 12 months to fulfill the life-saving work they do so Harry the nurse looked after me beautifully I know you've done this before Joe but uh, it was a pretty relaxing pain-free experience I have to say Yes, the Red Cross are amazing. They look after you so well. They're so experienced. I bet it didn't hurt anywhere as near, near as much as you expected. No, and I found out that I was only able to give plasma this time round because I'd been to Indonesia in the last three months and the chance of malaria is something that they're aware of. A lot of questions that need to be asked about your health, which makes a bit of sense. So I was able to give about 800 mils of plasma in this instance, which was a great rewarding experience. Nice chance to relax, actually, sit back and uh, unwind, have a sleep and feel like you're doing something positive at the same time. It's good. <laughs> you get it. No, you're not zoned out, are you? I think they gave me a sedative as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> so I look a little tired uh, on reflection, but it's a good sign of how relaxing it is. It took 45 minutes, the plasma are extracted from your blood and then they give your own red blood cells back, Heinz. Oh, so wow. you can donate plasma more often mm. than you can donate sure. blood and they need a lot of plasma for surgery and it's, uh, look, it's a rewarding thing to do and a relaxing thing to do at the same time. So good of you, Dust. It actually makes me want to donate my own blood because I've never done it before. Yep. But unlike you, not everyone is actually able to donate blood but plasma is just as important so if you are blood type O or A which are the most common you especially can make a huge difference. Yeah good point uh, well that is our show for the week get along to the website head to houseofwellness.com.au for more information on anything you've seen on the show and more there's also the House of Wellness radio show on every Sunday check out the House of Wellness lift out in your local paper with our man Gus Wallen gotcha for life one of our favourite guests so yes, far legend. Yes. coming up on the House of Wellness as always Thanks to our good friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time. Where's our power up coffee? Yeah, let's get into it. You want another one? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs>